We're talking today with Gabe Hudson of Byron Center, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. All right, uh, Gabe, can you start by giving us a little bit of background on yourself? Uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? Uh, I was born down in St. Joe County, down in a little town called Sturgis, in 1942, April 3rd, 1942. Okay. And it, what was your family doing at that time? Uh, well, my, my father was uh, working in a war machine for Kirsch Drapery Hardware. They were making war parts, airplane parts and the like. He was a tool and die maker. Uh, my mother was a homemaker. And I had six brothers, or one brother and four sisters, so there were six of us. And uh, about when I was six, we moved to a farm in Borough, Michigan. And we were there until I was 15. Great, great growing up on a farm. I... Uh, I I wish everybody had the opportunities that I had when I, when I was growing up because we had 83 acres that was ours and then uh, we had the run of several sections, my brother and I, and we could hunt and we, we, we worked the land and milked the cows and did all those good things and it was just a great time growing up. And uh, I, we moved back into, the, in, into Sturgis in, in 56 and then I graduated from high school in 60 and uh, went to Western Michigan, went up there, I was going to become a businessman, since uh, farmers were out of, the, out of the question now, I was going to be a businessman, and uh, of course the Vietnam War was just kind of kicking up in 1960, and uh, one thing led to another, I met a lovely lady there in 62, and her and I were married in 65, June of 65, so that makes 40, 45 years this year. And uh, in September, or November of 65, uh, I should have graduated already, but uh, my majors the first couple of years were kind of wine, women, and song. And so I, I, about the time I got married, I said, hey, I've got to crack down and go to work and get a degree. And uh, I was going to school full time and working full time. And I came home one day, and my wife was working. She had completed her degree requirements, but was working an internship at Borges Hospital. And uh, I walked in the door, and she says, you have a funny letter here from a draft board in St. Joe County. We don't live in St. Joe County, do we? I said, no, but that's where I registered for the draft at. And I opened it up, and, you know, it was the congratulations, Mr. Hudson. So what are we going to do, you know? All right, we talked it over, and all right, we're going to get drafted. We'll, we'll go, we'll go for two years, and come back, pick up our lives, and go. So I went to basic training. Okay, let's, let's back up here a little bit Roger. for a moment. Uh, now, were you, how was it, did you have a deferment while you were in school, or how did that work? I, I was, I, you're, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, I had a deferment, I was 2S, or S2, 2S, I think. I was a deferment, and uh, that deferment expired at four years. But uh, with four years plus, I got married, and at the time, they weren't taking married people. So my wife, hey, we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about the draft. Well, when I got the letter, I called St. Joe County and I said, "Hey, what's going on? I'm a married guy. I'm a student." Well, you've been a student for a long time. <laughs> I'm going to be a soldier. But I'm married. We don't care. We're out of single guys. St. Joe County is a very small little county. And your number's up. Good luck. Okay, so that, that was it for you. So All right. That's, that's how I ended up. Now, now, were you drafted into the Army or? The, well, the Army, yes, sir. Uh, the funny thing about that is uh, in 1968, I was in the middle of uh, Camp Eagle with the 101st Airborne Division. And I got a letter from our draft board in, in Centerville, Michigan, that said, if you do not report your status, <laughs> you will be <laughs> immediately drafted in the United States. So, you know, government was just as screwed up then as it is now. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's go back. So it's 1965, end of the year, you get your draft notice. Yep. Okay. And then where do you report then for basic training? Well, I went to uh, our lovely place called Fort Linderwood, Missouri. And how would you describe or characterize that place? Well, they called it Little Korea. But there's, uh, there's other ways of describing that that we probably shouldn't want to talk about on, on tape here for somebody to listen to. But uh, basic training was, was relatively easy. Uh, I, had, I wasn't in really bad shape. And 
and got in and I kind of got lucky on a couple of occasions and I became the first sergeant driver and uh, had a had a great basic training and uh, we we finished basic training well now when I when I got into basic you do a bunch of testing and all this other stuff well this master sergeant uh, Thacker was his name I'll never forget him I'm still looking for him uh, he called us into this little room there's about five or six of us and he said all of you people are you're all college kids you've all score very very highly you can do anything you want to do in the United States Army and I, yeah, that's kind of neat but hey sergeant you get two years we're all going home hey, hey, hey you know we all applaud all right that's okay guys you're all going to be 11 bushes which is combat infantry and most of you will be dead in six months can we talk <laughs> Sure, we can talk. So we, I started going through this book, and I said, this is kind of an interesting thing here. This, what's this photo interpreter job? Ah, man, he said, that's a great job. He said, you wear, you wear a suit, and you go to Ford Lands, and they give you a camera, and you take pictures. That lying bastard. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to do that, you know, just, just like James Bond, you know. Oh, man, I ought to be like James Bond, you know. I said, Sign this paper. So I signed the paper, and... Uh, I became a photo interpreter, but uh, you sit at a light table with, you know, 10,000 feet of film <laughs> mm -hmm. going through it, looking at jungle, and it was rather boring. But I, I came home from basic training, I picked up my lovely wife, and we reported to Baltimore, Maryland. That was our, our school, was at Fort Holliburg, which no longer exists. And as we were packing up to leave Kalamazoo, she said, you know, the next couple of years will be an adventure, Gabe. We'll have an adventure. Let's look at it as an adventure. All right. And 27 years later, we came home. Mm -hmm. But there was a, and it, it was all an adventure. Um, all right. I T got, go ahead. And tell me a little more about the photo interpreter school. Well, I got there, and the, the very first thing that happened, and, and that was very instrumental in, 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 in my whole career. Because I got I got there, and uh, read the the school rosters, and my name was not on the roster. So of course you go over to, to your NCO, and uh, my name's not on there. What's your name, kid? And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you can't start school yet. Go talk to that sergeant over there. So you go over there. Yeah, well, 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 all right. Well, you no, know, you can't start school. Your wife doesn't have a clearance. And, well, my wife's not in the army. Doesn't make any difference. Your wife needs a clearance. Well, how do we do that? Fill out this paperwork. You know, so I take it home that night, and her and I, and she says, I'm not going to fill out that paperwork. I said, you got to. If I want to go to school, you got to fill out that paperwork. I'm in the Army. Never mind. Don't argue about that. You know, it's the government. All right. <laughs> so we filled it out, and we submitted it. And they said, well, this is going to take somewhere between three and four months to complete. So you're going to just hang around. I don't want to hang around, you know. Well, that's it. So... I said, oh, you're going to hang around. This guy said, you know how to type? Um, so yeah. All right. Go to work up there. That, that, go to the work of that office over there. So I went to work for that office. And uh, I was working for a sergeant major. And he kind of liked me because of, I got there at 6.30 in the morning. The office opened at 7.30 in the morning. And after I worked there two or three days, I said, you know, if you give me a key, I can open up, clean the ashtrays, make the coffee, and you know, kind of do all the cleaning and things like that, and we won't have to do it at 7.30 when the office opens. So he gave me a key, and, and I started doing all that, and he went, you know, that's the cat's meow, you know. You're a, you're a good kid, man. <laughs> so uh, he kind of took me under his wing in and, and the process of a couple of months. He got me promoted a couple of times. And then he came in with a piece of paper, and he showed me how in 1966 I could make $3,500 by going to OCS and extending my three years about five months. $3,500. Now, you're not old enough to remember 1966, but that was a new Corvette. You know? So I told my wife, I said, man, if we could, you know, well, whatever you want to do, I, well, let's get a new Corvette, you know. All I have to do is go to school. So I 
put my hand up. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go to officer candidate school, you know. Hey, great, 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 great. And went to officer candidate school and down at Fort Benning, Georgia. And got there in, in March of 67, graduated August 67. Hot, oh, geez, Fort Benning. Kind of like Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, you know, I, I have my own words for Fort Benning. But uh, graduated from, uh, from OCS on the uh, 31st of August and immediately went to airborne school, became a paratrooper because I was being assigned to the 101st Airborne Division as a military intelligence officer out of the infantry school at Fort Benning. And they said, if you want to go and, and get jump qualified, all you need to do is sign this paper. I said, sure, I'll go. I might as well. I'm going to the division, you know. Well, that was worth $110 a month, uh, jump pay. So I went to jump school and uh, finished jump school. They said, hey, you're going to you get at least 30 days leave. You go home and you guys are all going to go to Vietnam. 101st had been alerted for Vietnam. Well, we had two cars by that time, not a Corvette. Not a Corvette. I was saving the Corvette. So uh, I said, well, look, we can leave one car at Fort Campbell. We'll take the other car back home to Michigan, and we'll enjoy the, the family. We'll spend 30 days up there. You know, it's going to be autumn, and it's going to be really, really great. So I went to Fort Campbell. I found that unit, went in, and said, hey, I'd like to leave a car. You're not Hudson by chance, are you? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm Hudson. I, the old man wants to see you. And I don't have a uniform on. I'm in civilian clothes. You know, I probably need a haircut. I don't know. I, well, that's, that's all right. He, he understands what you look like in uniform. You know, going. So I went and met this major. This major says, well, am I ever glad to see you? He says, Ed, you know, uh, we've, got a we've got kind of a special job for you. I only you do. Uh, what is the special job? Well, uh, were you planning to go on leave? Yes, sir. I, I haven't had any leave in about a year. You know, my wife and I, we're in 30 days. We're going, well, I, can you take five? <laughs> Wait a minute. And he says, uh, you're going to take a boat to Vietnam. A boat? A boat. A boat? <laughs> a boat. <laughs> God, I don't know anything about a boat. You don't need to. All you need to do is ride in the boat. All right. Now, before so, we kind of go onto the boat and, and discuss what was going on with that, I'm going to go back a little bit to some of this, this training that you did. Uh, when you did the standard OCS at uh, Fort Benning, uh, what was the atmosphere there like? I mean, you've got a bunch of guys who I think expect probably they're going to go off and be platoon leaders in Vietnam or something Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. We, we all knew that. We all knew that. Uh, our, our morale was high. Uh, feelings were good. We all knew, we, you know, none of us were going to get greased. We're all going to, we're all going to make it. Uh, were, were the people yeah. who were training you ones who had been there already? Son, if you don't learn this, you're going to die in Vietnam. That was, that, was their, that was their thing. You've got to learn this or you're going to die in Vietnam. You know, okay, pay attention. Now don't go to sleep on us here. You're going to die in Vietnam. And, of course, we started our duty day at about 4.30 and went to bed somewhere in 11 and 12, you know. And uh, we would go into air-conditioned classrooms at Port Benning, and immediately the sleep machine would come on. You know? <laughs> so, but the atmosphere was good. Mm -hmm. Morale was high. Um, I had a a good bunch of people that I trained with. Some of them I, I still I still correspond with, and, and we, we email. It makes that so easy now, you know. Uh, we lost probably about forty percent in Vietnam. We we had a very high attrition rate of, mm -hmm. of people that got killed over there. But in '67, the even much of the news reporting and so forth was still fairly positive. The military's expectations were pretty positive and so yes, forth they, the, yes, at, they at that were. stage. And, uh, and of well. course, that was the buildup. You know, mm -hmm. LBJ was, was just sending division after division over there, and, uh, and, uh, and the buildup was, was going on very, mm -hmm. very, very rapid. All right. And then tell me a little bit about how jump school worked, what they do there. Well, it was a three-week school. The, the first week, you run. I do. <laughs> you run and you learn how to put on a parachute, and uh, you know you learn how to put on the harness, and you do training with you know uh, how to get out of your harness, how to get in your harness. You go through the jump commands, uh, and then the, the second week you go to tower week, which you learn you jump out of a 34-foot tower with your with your harness on, and you ride a wire down uh, to the ground, and uh, that that's basically a lot of fun. I was, 
I was in absolutely phenomenal shape. I you know, just finished OCS, and uh, the airborne, the air, Sergeant Airborne, so they all wore black hats. And that's what you called all of them, Sergeant Airborne. And uh, they, they were really on second lieutenants. <laughs> and there was a couple of us there. I was, I was a little short guy, and I went through jump school with another Rich Flaherty, who was four foot nine. And uh, they used to accuse us of looking for, uh, you know, thermals, so we could stay up in the air longer and wouldn't have to run <laughs> but during our, our jump week. Right. And, uh, and then we, you went through tower week, and then on Monday morning, you went to jump week. And jump week was, was a five-day week. We finished on Wednesday. We had uh, a jump two days on Monday, or two jumps on Monday, two jumps on Tuesday, and one jump on Wednesday morning. And, and then we graduated on the drop zone, and we were done. Now, what proportion of the people who started the jump school finished with you? About 99%, okay. I think, 98%. Yeah, they, most, of the, most of it was the injuries. Mm -hmm. If you, you got hurt or something like that, they'd push you back or, or drop you out. But uh, there, was, there wasn't a lot of dropouts. Okay. Now, were the people in jump school, were you just with other officers or were all no, ranks? No, it was, it was all ranks, all, all ranks. In fact, that, that my stick buddy on the airplane was a, was a Marine private. And uh, on, our, on our fifth jump, we were riding this uh, C-119, an old twin-engine rattle trap of an airplane. And we finally got airborne after a couple of tries. And he said, sir, have you ever landed in an airplane? <laughs> sure. <laughs> is, this, is it like taking off, or is it more fun? <laughs> he, is a, a marine, we, and he was our soldier. Of, he was a soldier of the cycle, because he was a, he was a good kid, and it was very unusual for a marine. Uh, but he he was a good kid, and uh, the the officers and NCOs that were in the class, we voted on the soldier of the cycle, and we all voted for that marine. I I can't remember his name anywhere, but he was he was going to, he was he was on his way to Vietnam. And he was going to Ricondo, Ricondo to unit over there. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, are you going to jump over there? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I want to jump. I want to Ricondo, Ricondo. OK, great, great. That was Ricondo. Is that a version of reconnaissance or something it's, else? It's, it's a, a marine, marine version of, oh, I'm sorry, of, of reconnaissance. Uh, they were good. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were very, very, very good. On uh, my second trip, I got to support them a little bit. Okay. That's actually a cross between reconnaissance and commando. Is that what the doe part would be, do you suppose? Yeah. I, so kind I of like rangers or special anymore, forces. But they, were, yeah. they, you know, they would drop them in somewhere and, uh, and pick them up in five or six days. Right. Uh, we did that with our LERPs, Long Range Patrol, uh, special forces. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but... He, he was a good soldier, right. a, a good Marine, he, not Marine. You know, I'd say, you're a good soldier. He said, no, sir, I'm a Marine. Uh, All right. Uh, that kind of fills in some of the blanks there. So you go back. You, you've been informed here that you're going to go ride a boat. Let's ride a boat. Let's story there. You know, there's one other thing I want I to throw in here. Um, as a high school kid, I, mean, I, was, I was not the valedictorian. I had a lot of fun in high school. And I, I, I was played sports, had a little part-time job, you know, had a couple of girlfriends. But I was in, I started a typing class, uh, I think it was my junior year. And um, the first semester went well. I was getting B's and C's, you know, and the girls were <laughs> So the second semester, the girls just, they pushed the throttles home, you know, and they were doing 70 minute words a minute, you know. We're still over there at 10 and 11 words. So finally, I did, said to myself, I said, I'm going to fail this class. I've never failed anything in my life. So I went to the teacher. And the teacher's name was DeHaven, and uh, Cecil DeHaven, and uh, a little bit taller than I was. And I said, Mr. DeHaven, I, I want to drop this class. He said, no, you can't. I said, no, no, I, I, you don't understand. I'm going to fail. And I want to go to college, and I don't want that failure on my, on my you know, records when I go and, and apply to college. And he says, I don't care. 
He says, uh, you're going you're gonna to complete this class. And I said, I, I, I want to go see the principal. Sure, come on. So we went up there to, to Mr. Miller and uh, Bob Miller. And I said, I, I want to drop the typing. Why? I come on and fail it. So what? And I said, listen, I've never failed anything in my life, Mr. Principal. I, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't, I don't want a failure. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, son. You're going you're gonna to hang in there. So I, I won't let you drop it. And that was, he was God, you know, all right. So he walked out of there, and DeHaven told me on the way down the stairs, back to the typing room, he says, Gabe, just learn the keyboard. He says, you're going to fail the course. He says, I don't care if you write papers for the class, write letters to your girlfriends. I don't care what you do, but when you come in, sit there and learn the keyboard and learn to type. Well, it was, it was because that I knew how to type that I got the job that I did when I got to Fort Holliburg, and I found that sergeant major that said, hey, son, you can, you can do a little bit better than the average Joe, and it was because that guy. Now, I went back uh, a couple of years ago, and, and he, of course he's dead, but I, I, found his, I found his son, and he had married a classmate of mine, and I told him the story. And he said, you know, Gabe, he says, as, as I get older, once or twice a year, somebody will grab me and say, your dad really did something. And that's just, you know, it's a little anecdote, but those teachers, and, I, and it's today because I, I taught for a while, those teachers really care about kids. And, and they, they do the, the very, very best that you want, you know, that they think that they're going to do for you. I was... But anyway, that's that's another thing. Uh, your question was. We were back to the boat. Oh yeah, yeah, right. I, I got on this boat. We went to, we went to Mobile, Alabama, from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And if you steer from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, about one eight zero, you're bound to run into Mobile. And um, we got down there. There was uh, sixteen of us, and twelve was going to go on one boat, and then four of us was going to go on another boat. And uh, all right, we'll we'll go. And one of, the, one of the majors told me, as we were going down there, he says, now you watch them how they load that equipment and make sure that, you know, they don't bang it up or anything else. All right, yes, sir, we can do that. We're lieutenants, you know. Well, the other lieutenant outranked me by maybe a week. We were both, you know, brand new green lieutenants. And we got down there the very first morning we were there, we're sleeping on, on these ships or boats or freighters. They were freighters, what they were. And they were hauling, putting all of this equipment on there. And they didn't have it with chains or anything else. They would they'd put a truck on there, and then they would cut logs and, and, and timbers and, and lodge those things into place. Now it's all chains, you know, and they can load a ship in a, in a few hours where it took days to load that thing. And anyway, they, they banged this deuce and a half against this the wall and put a big dent in it. And so this guy said, we better go over and talk to that operator. Uh, I said, you know, maybe we just thought of let him do his job. Well, it's now, we, you know what, we've got to go talk to that guy. So we went over. <laughs> you better be careful with him. And of course, that operator, big teamster, you know, he kind of told us where we could take his truck <laughs> and to take his ship <laughs> and his crane. <laughs> so I said, you know, Tony, we ought to go downtown and have beer. <laughs> I think they can do this by themselves. And then they left it about a day, uh, two days. And they said, all right, Hudson, you and you and those four guys, three guys, two sergeants and a, and a uh, black kid, Reggie Pruitt. And you guys are going to come later when they, when they get that ship loaded. Okay. So a day or two went by and nothing happened. And so I went and found this major. I said, what's going on? I said, eh, we're missing a train. Said, Wait a minute. How can, you, how can you lose a train? Well, we don't know where it's at. You know, it left Fort Campbell. Uh, wait a minute, you know, what kind of a government <laughs> operation is this? Now I know about those things, you know, that I'm older. And how, how can you lose a train? Well, a couple of days later, this guy, and we're, not, we're doing nothing, absolutely nothing. So this guy, this major comes, he finds, us, finds me, and he says, uh, we found the train. It's in Chicago. Wait a minute, how did it get to Chicago? Don't ask questions, Hudson. It's going to be here in two or three days and they're going to work around the clock to get it loaded, you'll probably be leaving in, in seven or eight days. Okay. So I went and got my people together and told them. So this one NCO said, you know, we got rent-a-car on our orders. We ought to rent a car. 
so we can get around Mobile. I don't want to think about that. You know, it's on there. You know, you got a credit card? <laughs> yeah, I've got a credit card. But you can rent it, Lieutenant. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess that's all right. It says so on the orders. So we rented this Camaro convertible. <laughs> Had a ball with it. This this Reggie Pruitt. He came to me and he said uh, he was an artilleryman, and he said I I haven't been home and I'd like to go home and see my children before I go to Vietnam. And I said, well, I can't grant you leave. He lived in Alabama. We lived here. We were in Mobile. I said, I can't, I can't grant you leave. You got to, you know, I, I don't know what to do. And he says, well, I'm going to Vietnam. I know that. And if you let me go home, I'm not doing anything here. And I said, well, will you promise to come back? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I, I promise I'll come back. So I said, all right. I said, here's the telephone number of that office in there. I said, you call every two or three days. And we'll, so we set up a time. And I said, you, you go on home. So he called his parents. They came down. There was like four families came down to pick him up. And they took him home. And he, he kept calling. And finally I said, yeah, you need to come back. I'm going to you know, load the ship. We're going to get ready to go. So they all came back, uh, all those families, and his father came up and said, and thanked me. He said, it was very nice to see Reginald. Before he, before he goes to war, he had a chance to see his, his kids and, and see all of us and everything else, and, and we appreciate it. And we would we'd kind of like to, to do something for you. And you. You can't do anything for me. Well, I said, say a prayer. Oh, well, we'll say a prayer for you. You know, that's, that's good. But Reggie, didn't, Re Reggie never came home. He got killed over there as the two NCOs. One was a medic, and, and he took it uh, in, in Benoit when we were at Benoit with 101st, and the other one died in, a, in an airplane accident. So out of the four, I was the only one that came back home. And I, I often, that weighs heavy on my mind sometimes of, of why I came home. We had, a, we had a great time going over there on, on the ship. Um, I... The very first or second day, I was up on the bridge and was sitting in the captain's chair, and I found out that you shouldn't sit in the captain's chair. And about to, we went through, just before we got into Panama, we were some really, really rough seas there in the Gulf. And uh, we sat down for breakfast, and I kept looking out this porthole, you know, up and down, up and down. Popping Dramamine. I was taking Dramamine by the hands full. And uh, this, one of the cooks, we all, we all ate in the officer's galley. That was a decision whether we were going to eat with the, with the men or whether we were going to eat the, in the officer's galley. And I made that, I said, look, we're all going to war. We'll just take a table for four of the officer's galley. Wherever you want to be, that's fine with us. So... I, that morning, I, I cut into my eggs, and they were just a little bit runny. That was it. I said, man, i got to get out of here. I started running for the door, and I knew if I got to the door, I could get right to the side because I was going to throw up. And just as I opened the door and started in, this great big Captain Brown was coming in. And he was probably maybe 10 foot 5. <laughs> I ran into him and looked right at his belt buckle. I'm sorry, sir, it threw up all over his leg. <laughs> oh, I felt so bad. But I, God, I threw up things I ate as a baby. And uh, I, they helped me upstairs. I laid down in my room. And this old, we had an old black steward that uh, came up about a half an hour later. And uh, he gave me some water and stuff and told me to just lay down and rest. And he said, if you feel like throwing up, throw up. He said, just keep right on throwing up. And about lunchtime, the same guy came back. And he had, he had, he had been at sea for 200 years or something like that. And he had a plate of raw onions and soda crackers. And he said, eat these. Out of your, you're out of your mind, you know. Eat them. And I eat them and... I was never seasick after that, not not a bit. We, and we 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 get into we started at the Saigon River, and uh, I did have a, I, I drew a 45 out of the arms room. 
a supply room. They didn't have arms rooms there. And had to buy my own ammunition for it because all the ammunition was packed. So, you know, if we're going up this river, we ought to, we ought to get a 45. At least they have some kind of arms, you know, <laughs> going up the river. So I went and got this 45. I don't know if you ever shot a 45 before, but where were it? The 1911 Army 45, you know, and my capabilities with a weapon, I could maybe hit that wall. <laughs> so I got this thing and I stuck it in my belt. <laughs> I walked out on the deck and some guy says, what the hell are you doing with that? I said, what happens if we get attacked? He says, put that thing away before you hurt somebody. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tucked it back in my duffel bag, and, and we rode up river, got there, and started unloading the boat. And had you stopped any place along the way? No. No, no, it's 37 days. 37 days. My wife says, let's go on a cruise. I said, I would have been on a cruise. I don't care to go anymore. The food was outstanding. The, the, the people that were on the ship was outstanding. They, they were all, they, they knew we were going to war. Uh, the cook, he was a, a guy named Pierre. Are we in trouble? No, his mic just died, so do you remember the last question? Would you like water, Pete? A little thirsty? Negative. Negative, okay, sir. Thanks, Brian. It was a good trip. It was really a, just a fantastic trip. Okay, so basically at this point we have gotten you to Vietnam, you're on the boat, you're heading up the Saigon River. Now, do you unload at, at Saigon or outside of it? Or? Well, we, we unloaded it at Saigon and we loved it, and then they motored all of that equipment to the streets up to Benoit, which was uh, about 20, 25 miles to the north. Mm -hmm. And what was your first impression of Vietnam when you got there? Stunk. Diesel oil and uh, heavy in the diesel oil and diesel fumes. And in, along all of military installations, they mixed the human waste with diesel oil and burned that. So that was always a very appetizing thing to wake up to in the morning. Um, very, very crowded streets. You know, I, I, I didn't expect anything like that. But it was a, it was, it was a, a, a real eye-opener. And uh, we, we were there for two or three days, and we finally we decided, okay, we're going to go see if we can't find, get something to eat other than, than on the ship and everything else. And we, we wandered into a, like a, a French coffee house and, and had some French espresso. And I determined right in there that I did not like French espresso at, at all. And, uh, but there was, there was some great food over there. And I uh, found my way around Saigon a little bit, learned my leg around it, and I've got to go back to Saigon quite a bit while we were there the first couple of months at Benoit. And then right after Tet of 68, which was July, late January, um, 30 or 31 January, um, the division moved uh, north, and we moved up to, to Wei Fu Bai, which eventually became Camp Eagle. Okay. Now, what were you doing while you were at, at Benoit? What was... Uh, I was a uh, military intelligence officer, and we were working in the image reinterpretation section of the uh, military, uh, 101st Military Intelligence Detachment. And there was uh, about 20 of us that worked in that section. Okay. And, 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 were, and were you there uh, when the Tet Offensive started? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and so what, if anything, happened around to your unit or around it or... Well, we were, we were on Benoit Army Base, which was right next door to uh, Benoit Air Base. Um, Benoit Air Base was was attacked by a sapper battalion, and uh, we found after after the fact we found our barber who was used to cut Fred the barber we called him we had a little barber shop, he was in the wire with a satchel charge, <laughs> so uh, I guess he had thing pretty he had cased it pretty well you know uh, anyway he was he was dead in the wire, uh, they hit us pretty hard a lot of a lot of rockets a lot of mortars. And uh, my my wife, of course, she was home here, and and she had heard on the on the radio that Benoit Army and Benoit Air Base had been overrun, and there were hundreds of casualties, and which is not true. 
Uh, we had a hell of a battle there, but uh, we were not overrun. Uh, I don't think any, except for a couple of them, even got inside the wire. Um, they did do something that really hurt us, though. They blew up our Class 6 store. That's boob store. That's the boob store. <laughs> they, they blew that up, and, uh, and they, they hurt one of, the, one of the clubs when they kind of... The Army in Vietnam was a little bit different than the Army in Iraq and Afghanistan now, where they, they shy away from alcohol or anything else. It was uh, pretty readily available, uh, like a dime, of, a dime of beer, you know, and a dime of mixed drink, and they had clubs for everybody. Now, was the, was the Army base under attack for just a very short amount of time, or? No, it lasted about a day and a half. Okay. And that what were they, you doing during that day? Um, we were inside the wire enough that we continued our, we continued our mission. We, we, we put a sentry outside, you know, somebody to, to kind of keep an eye on what was going on. But we were also at division headquarters, so we were pretty well protected. And um, we, I never, other than bullets flying over your head every so often or a mortar going on, we just, okay, we just continued to do our work because we, we were pretty busy. Mm -hmm. At, uh, they tried to do. They were taking to taking some photos of what was going on once the daylight got there, and some of that hot stuff was coming to us pretty hot. And uh, we were taking a look at that and, and and putting reports out on that. So you were actually looking at pictures of the Saigon area and what was going looking, on there. Looking at the pictures of the Benoit area, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that was kind of it. And then that all died down, and everything, you know, you kind of went back to business as usual. And then we, I started, uh, we also started flying a little bit over there. We had a, uh, it was very hard for us to get uh, imagery or f photographs or negatives, whatever it was, because uh, the priority that the 101st had was not real, real high. So uh, we decided among, in, among us in the, the imagery interpretation shop that if we got some cameras, we could go out and, and shoot some sites ourselves on points of interest to the division, and and we could build mosaics or photo maps or whatever we needed to do from from that handheld stuff. Um, we ended up with three or four uh, Pentax cameras, and that's how we most of us started flying over there, is laying on a on the floor of a helicopter or hanging out the the window of a bird dog, you know, and snapping snapping pictures, and we opened our own development center where we would develop our, our, our own film. And, uh, and we did that. That was, that was a lot of fun. Very, very interesting. And then you begin to fly with the same people again and again and again. And uh, they would say, hey, you know, you're going to fly with us. Something happens to me. You better be able to take that stick in the back and at least put us on the ground, you know? Oh, yeah. You think I could fly? Let's put the stick back in there. Yeah. Put the stick in and out of the bird dogs, you know? Hey man, this is great, and uh, so I, I, man, I, I really like to do this, and just fell in love, fell in love with with flying over there, and uh, then we, when we moved north, we up to to Camp Eagle, uh, we used to go. We had Fubai, we had four hours, we had four hours of bird dog a day, and then we normally had two hours of helicopter first and last hour of the day. Now, can you explain what bird dog refers to? Oh, it was a, a, an L1. It was a little single engine, old Piper Cub, mm -hmm. starched wing, uh, not a lot of power. But uh, we hang a couple rockets on, on each wing <laughs> and, and, go, and go looking. And it was, it was a, a, a aerial reconnaissance, mm -hmm. recon. Go out and, and do some aerial recon, visual recon, and it was it was a, a good mission. We did a lot of good work. Wasted a lot of fuel too. Wasted a lot of fuel. Uh, uh, we got when we got north. Um, we I started. I was with the division until July, and then they sent me down to a brigade, the second brigade, and I was doing the same thing at the brigade that I was doing at the division. Um, Ended up getting a couple of uh, aircraft hours every day, and we'd take a look at points of interest that the old man, you know, the, vision, or the brigade commander wanted, or targets that we thought might be worthwhile, and then also some helicopter time, and and 
flying a helicopter, I'd begin to fly with the same kid day after day after day. And a uh, young kid, you know, both about the same age. And he was a warrant officer, and I was a, I was a lieutenant. But, hey, can I fly this thing? You think you know how? You know, sure. <laughs> so you trade off, and it was the more I flew, the more I just really, really loved it. So when I, I told my wife, I said, one thing I'd like to do is when I get back to the States, I'd like to, I'd like to go to flight school and learn how to fly. Now, did you spend a full year over there doing this 15 kind of work? Months. Fifteen months. Fifteen months. Yeah, I, I, I had the pleasure of being extended. The 101st got there, and of course, we're all we're wearing the Screaming Eagle. We're all tough as nails. And uh, the, the boss, the uh, detachment commander, he said, some of you guys, you know, we're all not going home the same week. So some of you guys have got to leave and go to other units. Not me, not me, not me, not me. So the boss did. He left. <laughs> he went to another unit. Well, we get this new guy in, and this new guy says, all right, you guys going to hang around? You can hang around all you want. Draw straws. Some of you going to go home early. Some of you going to go home late. I got to go home late. <laughs> so they were setting it up so they could rotate in replacements and not move the whole right, group out right. at the same you could, time. You could, you know, you could lose a couple of people a month and never, never lose any kind of continuity or, or mission accomplishment or anything like that. You could keep everything right on the, right. On the up, on the up and up, and keep on moving. Yeah. How dangerous was the work you were doing at this point? What was the risk of getting shot down? Uh, they shot at you quite a bit. They, they weren't very good shots, but they, they shot at you. They, they didn't like taking pictures. And if you, uh, if you shot at them, they would normally shoot at you. you, you, you we carried an M16 or a, a 38, you know, a 38 in your survival vest. And so we didn't have a lot of firepower, but we did have a couple of rockets, normally with uh, white phosphorus, what they called Willie Pete, for marking targets on, uh, on the wings. And um, it was on a regular basis, those gomers didn't like you, didn't like you shooting at them. Uh, we got a helicopter shot up one time, and we had to put it down on the ground because they, they hit the transmission. And uh, of course, 60 pounds of pressure in there and all the oil was coming out. And, and later I learned that the, the immediate reaction is land now. So we set it on the ground and uh, the little gomers were not too far away. And another bird came in and picked us up and uh, there was no way we were going to get that out of there. So the guys called some Cobras in, and they, they blew the machine in place. We, we got the radio heads. We had two radio heads that we got. The pilots did that. They had the radio heads and, and pulled those out of there. And the machine was destroyed on the ground. Mm -hmm. You don't want to leave anything behind that the enemy can use no. for anything? No, because they used everything. They used whatever you left behind, they, they used. And we had a, an instant and it must have been August or September of 68, where I was out with this kid in, a, in flying a, a loach. It was a huge 500 helicopter. And um, we found an artillery shell, a 175. It was a pretty good sized shell. And it was laying beside a trail. Somebody had moved it. Because it's not unlikely when you shoot an artillery barrage some of those rounds don't go off. All right. So what those clowns would do is they'd go over there and they'd dig those things up and they'd make booby traps out of them. So we found this thing. It was laying. Obviously, somebody had carried it there because it just didn't roll there. And uh, we tried. It was right on the division, the, the, the boundaries between the first infantry, or rather the first calf. first calf was still there at Camp Evans and 101st, 2nd Brigade. And we stayed there for a fuel load, trying to get somebody to blow it up, give us some artillery, do something in there to blow that thing up. And we, oh, it's not our responsibility. No, we don't have this. No, we got to get clearance from this guy. We got this was. Finally, my my buddy Bill says, "Hey, we got enough fuel to get home on. You know, we're we're going home." And uh, he says, "We're not going to shoot at that with an M16." <laughs> So we went home, and I was I was angry. Talked to my boss. Settle down, Lieutenant. Things like that happen, you know. Well, five days later, 
a 175 blew up and took out five guys and they were 101st on a patrol. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if it's the same shell or not, but it happened within probably a, a, a kilometer of where that thing was at. And I, you really carry anger. I still carry anger about that. It was so dumb. You know, so I, I, okay, a couple of rounds, blow it up, you know. Okay. Now, when you flew your missions, did you do any where you were coordinating closely with units that were on the ground, scouting out things for them, or were you doing more reconnaissance for sort of longer distance planning? Most of ours was for, for long range planning, but if somebody was, if somebody got into trouble, we would, would get, we'd lend them as much support as we, as we possibly could, and they always appreciated it. Mm -hmm. they, they always appreciated it, you know. Hey, you got some eyes overhead, you know. Oh, yeah. what's, what's in that brush line over there? You don't want to know. <laughs> uh, there was, we had a, a Marines up there just north of uh, where we, the 101st was at. There was a, a Marine platoon that was, got into a hell of a firefight one, night, one afternoon. And uh, they were requesting air support. And we were in a bird dog and this, this you know, single engine fixed wing. And uh, the pilot said, hey, Gabe, we can, we can go up there and at least take a look, you know, because the guy was on guard talking to us. Said, hey, we'll come up and take a look. So I went up there and made a couple of passes and threw a couple smoke grenades out. And I, see, I, I told the, the, the Marine officer on the ground, or, or, I assumed he was an officer, I said, you got heavy machine guns up there, you know. Don't do anything until you get some, some air or something up here to take care of those things. You know, where's your fire support? Where's this? Where's that? We don't have it. We don't have it. And, and they ended up charging that thing. And it was it was it was slaughter, absolute slaughter. And another thing made me very very angry. You know, when I came back from Vietnam, I was I was ready to get out, and just throw the whole thing to the side. And and because it was so dumb, some of the things we did. And, and of course. There was no fly zones, free fire zones. You, you, you go here, you can't shoot. You go here, you shoot anybody that's in the area. Um, disgusting. Mm -hmm. um, one, one story, we were up at, uh, at the, the Bow River ran through there where we were at. Called, I think it was, no. I think the Bow was down. I, I don't remember anymore. The, I'm getting old. There was a river out anyway. Went up there. We were at LZ Sally with the Second Brigade, and we get a report that there's pink elephants up at, at a certain coordinate, and they're they're carrying ammunition and they're carrying equipment. And my boss said he he threw the thing over to me, and he says, "Have you got an airplane today?" And I said, "Yes, sir." And he says. Go look for the pink elephants. <laughs> you know, the brigade commander wants to know where the pink elephants are. Jesus, don't these people drink? Well, <laughs> okay, we're not going to go look for pink elephants. Well, we, we flew up there, and sure enough, there were some elephants, and they had rolled in that red clay over there, and they looked halfway pink. These, they're really pink elephants. <laughs> you know? The way you smoke it, had to know. <laughs> really, there's big elements up here, you know. So they called in here, the Air Force came in and killed a whole bunch of them. Well, we got some rains that night. We got four or five days of rain. And those elephants floated down the river, floated up and floated down the river. One of them got stuck just outside our gate at a, at a bridge. Well, you could smell that elephant from from miles away, downwind. And the people from the village was out there carving that elephant up. And it was like two hours. And it was gone. There was just some bones laying there. They took all of, they took all of that meat and, and, and took it away. Not an interesting little story. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, while you were uh, there on, on that first tour, did you get any R and R time or leave time or anything like that? I met my lovely wife in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, she was living here in Grand Rapids, working at St. Mary's, and uh, 
I said, we got five to seven days of R&R. &R. And I said, listen, why don't you come and we'll meet each other in Hong Kong. And we did that at eight months. I was, we, I was there for eight months before that happened. And uh, she came over there and we, we met in Hong Kong. We had a, a really great time. Hong Kong's a beautiful, beautiful city. And I was supposed to get up and leave at 2 o'clock in the morning to meet my flight back. and I didn't go. And so my wife left the next day at you know, 11 o'clock or something like that. So I put her on an airplane, and, and she was flying to Seoul. We had friends in Seoul. And uh, so I said, well, went to the R&R &R Center, and I said, I missed the flight. Lieutenant! And they screamed and screamed and screamed at me. And I said, well, there was a, a Navy lieutenant over there. And he said, why did you miss the flight? I said, my wife was in, I met my wife here. Came time for me to go. We were snuggling, snuggling. I said, screw it, I'm not going to go. <laughs> he said, I'm going to get you a ride. And if you miss this ride, I'm going to court-martial you. So I don't worry, I won't miss the ride. So I was walking out of there, and you've heard of Air America. Well, there's an Air America thing over there. And I walked over and I said, hey, you guys going anywhere near Da Nang soon? Yeah, we're going to go over there tonight. Mind if I ride along? No. Yeah. You know, no orders, no nothing. So I ride to Da Nang, catch a helicopter up the next day and up to, to Camp Eagle. And I get in there and go in and sign in and tell the old man I'm back and everything else. Hey, Gabe, you're a day early. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I, I went get into Da Nang rather than, uh, so about three months later, they got a report that I had missed the airplane. And the old man comes out and he says, what is this? You missed your airplane. I said, the guy came over early, remember? Yeah, stupid army. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was that was that was a great trip. That, that was that was a great great trip with with the wife. Great R and R. Great R and R. Okay. Other other particular things that happened in that first tour that kind of stand out in your memory that uh, we haven't covered here yet. No, not particularly. Okay. When I when I came home, I landed out here at the airport met my lovely wife and uh, had my first encounter with the peaceniks because I got spit at it <laughs> as we were walking down the, down the ramp. So I said, there's about baby killer in the lake. <laughs> was this and late 68 or 69 then? This or? was late 68. Okay. And uh, my yeah. wife grabs me and she said, let it go. Okay. Now, were you coming home at this point in uniform? Or? Oh, yeah. yeah we were, we were uh, you, you had to travel in, in uniform. And, a little, little story about that. We, uh, I was being assigned to Fort Lewis, Washington. I knew that. But my wife was in Michigan. Well, when I went over to start filling out the paperwork, they said, we're going to send you to uh, someplace in California, you know, that'll, and then you can just go to Lewis. I said, I don't want to go there. I'd rather go back to, uh, was it uh, Fort, jeez, uh, Fort Dix. Okay. I can't remember the air, the air, board, the air, air Force Base there. I said, that's where I want to go. And the guy said, well, sir, we're, we're supposed to send you the closest to where we're, wherever you're going. And I, I'd just come from the Class 6 store, and I had a case of Budweiser on my shoulder. And he said, of course, we may be able to fix that. Well, set it over on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He typed it. He says, that's where you're going. So we, we get over there, and uh, we get home, and we're traveling in khakis. We didn't have any greens with us. So we get, get processed, get all the way through customs and everything else, walk out into this big terminal, and we run over to, there, there's two warrant officers and another lieutenant, and we're kind of paired up together. And we walked over to a, a ticket desk, and so we said, you know, I need to go to Detroit. This guy was going, you know, going all over the place. And she said, well, there's, there's a ride out of Philadelphia Airport at 8 o'clock for Detroit. But I don't know how you're going to make it. 
And I said, well, how do we get there? He said, well, you're going to have to go out there and probably get your limo or something. They'll, they'll take you over there. So these other guys said, oh, we're all going to go about the same time. But we've got to get to Philadelphia. <laughs> First limo we got to open the door and said, we need to go to Philadelphia. The guy said, well, I normally go with 12. I said, you have 12. He said, mm, right, get in. <laughs> of course, you got it. You'd just been paid, you got a pocket full of money, you know, you don't even remember what money was, right? As we started out the door, this little skinny airman, he was maybe 90 pounds, and he stepped in front of me and he said, Sir, before you leave, you must report to Fort Dix and get an Army green uniform. And I said something like, I was going to stuff his head somewhere and to get out of the way. Yes, sir! <laughs> he stepped aside. I, I always kind of felt sorry for that little kid because we weren't very, we weren't very kind. He was doing his job, mm -hmm. but we came home and uh, and then I, I started. A, we we went to Fort Lewis, Washington, and uh, we had our first child out there. I started looking for a job, and uh, I had no no college degree because I was drafted. And okay, I want to. I want to do something with the trade that I had, which was the photo interpreter. And oil companies and all of that were supposed to really be hot on that thing right now. Well, I sent out 50 resumes and I got two answers, one from the CIA and one from Defense Intelligence. And I said, oh man, I don't want to get, uh, what am I going to do? And so I was with an aviation unit out at Fort Lewis and um, the old man out there, uh, the lieutenant colonel, and, and he, he really liked me. I used to fly with him a lot at, in the evenings because he would do, the only time he could really fly was in the evenings. And he said, why don't you go to school? Why don't you go to, well, you know, I, you know I, I said, why don't you, come on, you go to, why don't you go to flight school? And then I was sitting at my desk one day and the phone rang and it was military intelligence branch and a, a major up there and he says, Gabe, you had expressed an interest at one time going to flight school. I can put you in an OV-1. That was, that's a twin reconnaissance airplane. It was really state-of-the-art at that time. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, I can do it. Do you want to go? Yes. Do you want to talk to your wife? No. <laughs> I know she'll approve. So I hung up and got in my car and drove. I left the hangar and drove over to where the headquarters was and walked in and uh, just on my boss, and I said, hey, Branch just called, then get me an OV-1 slot. He opened his desk drawer, and he had all my paperwork filled out. He had everything all filled out. He said, I knew it, I knew it, sign here. Next day, I went over and got a physical. That afternoon, he and I got in an airplane, and we, we flew it to Washington. We flew the application to Washington. And I left there with, with orders in hand to go to flight school. And I was, I was very, very happy. Um, where did they do the flight school? Well, we, we left uh, Fort Lewis, and uh, we determined that we were going to save money. We weren't going to call home. We had to go over to Fort Stewart, Georgia, uh, opposite ends of the country. And uh, the, baby, the baby was like three weeks, four weeks old or something like that, a little baby Carl. We were stopped one night in a driving snowstorm in Pueblo, Colorado. And we pulled off the road and found a, a place, and uh, we'll, we'll go over and get a bite to eat. And there was two little old ladies in there in this restaurant, and they came over and said, "Why do you have a little child like that out on a night like this? You should be at home. We don't have a home. <laughs> We're in the military. We're on our way to school." And the ladies just shook their head and, and walked off. But, okay, uh, we get to Fort Stewart. Now, that's like five or six days we were driving. Stopped to see one friend along the way. Never bothered to call home. We're going to save money. So we, we walk into Fort Stewart. It's Friday afternoon. I'm supposed to sign in on Monday, but save a couple days to leave. I'll sign in on Monday, Friday afternoon. You know it's late. They can't screw with you. Uh, by this time, I'm a captain. And walked in and said, hey, you know, I'm here, I'm here for school, you know, I've got, just want to sign in to save some leave. And the sergeant looks up and said, 
You wouldn't be Hudson, would you? Yes. Where in the hell have you been? <laughs> I said, uh, I'm driving here. And he says, do you realize that the whole army is looking for you? I said, what do you mean the army is looking for me? And he says, here, there's a list of messages. One, call your mother. <laughs> Two, call this guy before 5 o'clock at branch. Call him first. So I called him, and that same guy that sent me to school. And I said, he's, where are you? And I said, I'm at Fort Stewart. Why? Because that's what the orders say. Fort Stewart, Georgia. He said, the fixed wing course is closed. You're going to helicopter school. Uh, where's that? Fort Walters, Texas. We were with two hours of there <laughs> at one point. I said, oh, no. Yes. So I told my wife, I said, okay. I said, when, when I went, it was going into the building. I said, at least our travels are over for a while. And I walked out, and I got in the car, and I sat down. And she said, what's the matter? And I said, we're in the wrong place. Oh, what building do we go to? And I said, Texas. <laughs> and only a wife can go off on the army like this. <laughs> hey, it's not my fault. Not. So I called my mom, my mom and dad. And my dad says, where have you been? I said, traveling. Gabe, the whole army's looking for you. They call here every day. Are you in trouble? No, I'm not in trouble. I had to change the orders. Why didn't you call home? I'm saving money. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So we, get, we go to Fort Walters, Texas, and get involved in helicopter training. And uh, it just fell in love, just fell in love with it. And every, every day it was something new and exciting. I had a new baby and a, and a wife that understood. And we were in a, a class of officers. That, I think it was 12 captains or so. We all, all, all had Vietnam experience. Mm -hmm. We're all at least one time losers, sometimes two. And uh, we were a bunch of young kids. Um, we're going to learn how to fly Army airplanes and we're going to contribute to the war effort. Morale was high. We had a great time. Uh, I, we only lost out of the class. We didn't lose any of the captains. We should have lost one captain, but he didn't. They, they, he, we didn't lose the captain. He, he, he couldn't fly. And he ended up going to Vietnam, and he flew into a mountain with a loaded Huey. Uh, that makes me mad, too. But uh, we, we went through training. I had a, lot of, had a lot of fun. All of us knew, you know, as soon as, as, soon as you finish, you're going to go right back to Vietnam. Well, when I finished helicopter training, I went back to Fort Stewart, for a transition to fixed wing airplanes. And uh, flew single engine, T-41, learned on that. And then I was there for eight or nine weeks and went to, back to Rucker, uh, went through a multi-engine instrument course, and then went combat surveillance course with the OV-1. And uh, that was just a, what, a, what a neat airplane. And uh, I'd, I'd had some time in there anyway, at least a little stick time. And it was a, it was a great airplane. And then. I knew I was going to go to a, an OV-1 unit in Vietnam. Now, were you training to be? You were training to be a pilot for the pilot at that point. Yes, at the OV-1, we had there was uh, we had a bunch of cameras, uh, uh, a radar system, side-looking airborne radar, uh, and infrared system that kind of like low-light TV, mm -hmm. and all of it was all almost all real time except for the photography. Okay. Now, would a, yeah. did a plane like that have a crew, or was it just a pilot? Uh, pilot and he had a, a tech observer on the other side and he ran the equipment. Mm -hmm. he, he ran the cameras and he ran the, the slider system and everything else. You were totally aware of what was going on. You had been through the same classes that he did and you could, you could troubleshoot it. Mm -hmm. You flew it every day and he would, they would rotate you know, two or three times a week. And um, there was just a, the two of you. And um, a, great, a great airplane, fully acrobatic. And, uh, the older models had a, had a, enough power to, to fly, and got to Vietnam and assigned to the to a unit and flew. And I was there for two or three weeks, and they made me a platoon leader because of my rank. I was a captain with a little bit more seniority than a lot of those guys, so I became a platoon leader and uh, flew in the mornings. Normally, flew at, at four o'clock, 
have its wheels in the well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, where were you flying out of? We were flying out of uh, out of Fubai at first, which is back in, in I Corps. We were flying out of Fubai, and we were there for three or four weeks, and then we moved down to uh, a place called Marble Mountain, a little Marble Mountain Army Airfield, uh, about a 3,500-foot PSP strip, perforated steel plate, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a great, great airstrip, kind of short. <laughs> when you got got that old airplane, it weighed gross out about 19,000 pounds, and you know, full load of fuel. And in the afternoon, you're trying to get that thing off at density altitude, you know, get it bouncing out a little bit on here and pull it up, and suck up the gears, get it airborne. And that, that's not altogether true, but it was kind of hard to get off there sometimes with the with the density altitude and the short runway like that. But it was a lot of fun. Now, were you doing missions that were in a way similar to what you had done before, just with a better plane? Or? No, no, we weren't. Uh, we weren't doing any of that. We were working mostly for the the embassy down in Saigon, and and then we sent a lot of the stuff back to the states. Um, the mission that I flew a lot over there, we had radar, and we'd fly off the the north coast. We'd fly out about 15 to 20 clicks. We were feet wet. And we started looking airborne radar. We looked over in the North Vietnam, and we flew up to you know, just north of Vinh, and we turned around because we couldn't go any further because we were slow movers. And uh, with the with the radar mission that I had, you could pick up convoys and things like that. And we we did a lot of that night at night. And then you would go through a controlling agency and say, Hey, I've got moving targets over here at so and so and nothing was supposed to be moving. So they'd say, okay. And uh, for a couple of months, I worked with a, a Navy call sign streetcar, and they loved us, because we had passed those targets to them. And they'd go in and you could say, of course you're sitting there at 15,000 feet, and put it on autopilot, say, so so they're gonna look over there. And, yeah, 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 and you'd listen to them on the, on the net, you know. Okay, we're going to roll in hot. All right, I've got, I got a truck. Boom! You'd see the little explosion over there. Yeah. So we we did some we did some good work there. So were you shooting at? Uh, we didn't the, shoot. Well, no, the, well, but the people who were doing the shooting, you were observing. But yeah, we were observing. Uh, but they were were they firing at, at naval targets or were they on land or? They were they were from a carrier. Right. Working working uh, the, the, the coastal highways. Okay. So there were areas where the enemy was not supposed to be moving things, and so those were well, targets? Or? The, the whole North Vietnam was supposed to, you know, you, you weren't supposed to move anything. If it was any big, long, if you, you got a, a long stretch of moving target indicators, it was a convoy. Mm -hmm. You just, you know it's a convoy. So you'd call that in, and somebody would go look at it, and yeah, it's a convoy. And if, unfortunately, those convoys would shoot back. <laughs> now, were you flying mostly at night? Is that the I, I did a lot of the, the nighttime. I was early morning, mm -hmm. and, and then I could do my platoon leader job during the day. And then I also was a tech supply officer over there to help with the maintenance. Okay. And did the North Vietnamese have any aircraft they were using in that area? They or? had MiGs. And uh, I, was, I was just north of Vin one time, and we had a MiG call. And uh, I rogered the MiG call, and I probably had 10 miles to go. And I was going to, you know, go the 10 miles and then turn around, and uh, they're chugging along, doo -doo, fat, dud, and happy. Okay, I, I, I heard the main call, and uh, our control and agency came up, and our call sign was Spud, and said, "Spud, you get the main call. Roger got the main call. I, I, I got it. You know, I, I got the call. Yeah. Well, he's about uh, 50 clicks and moving at you." <laughs> ah! <laughs> Pulled the trials back, turned that thing over, and and got out of there. Went back on the deck and, and learned a, learned a lesson that day. Mm -hmm. um, then we flew out of we flew out of Thailand for a while. I was over there for ten weeks, and uh, we worked for the Laotian military attaché. We were flying a plane of jars, we mostly low light TV or infrared, and uh, photography. And we did all of that at night. We'd take off about 10, 11 o'clock, fly a fuel load, because we, we did not have capability of in-flight refueling. So four hours was a fuel load. You could get, uh, you could squeeze, you know, three and a half out of it. 
and uh, we did it. We did a lot of good work up there, uh, working with the Air Force and finding targets. That that was a fun. That was a, a fun mission. That was it was very very rewarding. But I had a I had an incident that happened. Um, I had a kid come over, and we he was running up the system while you were running up the airplane, and. Uh, he said, I got a problem here, I got a problem. So he, I stopped and went back and, and fixed his problem with the system. We worked through it and went back. I always used my book, always used my checklist. My old, my old, my old friend of mine and that got, my, got me into flight school, I, he, was, he said, always use your book, Gabe. I picked up the book and did the whole thing. We went out and got shot at, not hit, but we, did, we were shot at several times, came back, landed at we were at uh, at Udorn and, and roll out. Why don't you put your gear on the ground, you know? You'd steer with your feet. So you reach up and you'd undo your rise. We had an injection seat in the airplane. And uh, we'd reach up a little. Turned around. Risers were still connected to the seat. I'd never I'd never connected them. Had my left belt on. Uh, I, we got over to taxi, taxi shut it down, and I could hardly get out of the airplane. Well, what a what a dumb thing, what a dumb, dumb, dumb thing to do. And I, that ate on me for five or six days. Just really, what? A, so know, what could have happened to you? You, you, you know, pull a handle, read the prayer, you go out of the airplane, the seat went one way, and you're shooting. <laughs> you just <got> another way. <laughs> and I, oh, jeez, you know. So it was, it, you, you, nobody else to blame except me. Mm -hmm. I interrupted my book, or, and I did not go back and to, mm -hmm. a, to a point that I should have. Okay. Now you mentioned you're, you're flying over Laos and the, the Plain of Jars, which is sort of farther into the country. Did, were you also flying over the Ho Chi Minh Trail area, or the areas no, right along that? No, we, we, did not fly the, we did not fly the trail. Um, we were a slow mover, mm -hmm. and uh, no. They, that was left up to the Navy and the Air Force with the fast movers. We we did not fly the trail. Okay. There were some lucrative targets right in there that was we got a lot of we had a lot of fun at. All right. I know you mentioned there you were working with a Laotian military attaché. Yeah, he was American. Oh, oh he, the American. He, he was a military. He was a military attaché. Four hours. In Vientiane. Okay. And uh, that was a. That was a, quite a trip. They invited us up there a couple of times for, for dinner. You know, come out up and have dinner. You know, so we'd go up and travel on classified orders with Air America, and you know they'd tell you what to wear. You know, wear this color shirt, this color pants. Uh, the first time I went to Ventian, we landed at the, at the airport on Air America, and I got off, and I met my my counterpart, you know, and he said, you want to get any kip? Kip is their money. And I said, yeah, I want to, while we're here, I want to get some gold for my wife. You know, I want to go gold shopping and everything else. So he says, okay, so they got an exchange booth right over here. So I went over there and a cute little girl in that booth, you know, and she said, uh, uh, you want to exchange money? I said, yeah. I, I said, uh, I, th I think I'll get $50 worth of kip. And she said, how much? Uh, $50. $50? Sure, $50. Just a moment, please. So she goes in the back. Comes out. She had a paper bag full of money. <laughs> Here. There's big bills like this, little bills like this. What is this? I walk over there and there's a paper bag. Guys, what you do? And I said, I got $50 worth of kip. He says, Gabe, what are you going to spend $50 worth of kip on? Nobody wants it. <laughs> So we spent as much as we could, and uh, I tried to buy gold with it. They didn't want, they didn't want any kip. They wanted a credit card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, wanted, they wanted a credit card. When uh, your little gold thing in, in Vintia, I got some gold for my wife, and I said, you know, I, I got this kip. No, we want. You have a credit card? Do you have a credit card? Yes, I have a credit card. Yeah, give us a credit card. <laughs> Don't worry, we won't cheat. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so that that was that was a that was a good mission over there. 
Now, did you spend, how long then did you spend in Southeast Asia total in that? that well, tour? I had another 15 month tour mm -hmm. because I, I got back from, I got back from, uh, from Thailand. I went back to Da Nang. The unit had moved to Da Nang, Maine at that time. And we were flying out of uh, Da Nang, Maine. And that was mm, probably late September. Of what year? Uh, it's 72. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we got orders. We were going to stay on the unit down and, and send it home. So everybody was, hey, hey, we got to go home. We got to go home. We got to go home. So there was four of us in the unit. And we were all doing our jobs and everything else. And the uh, group commander walked over and asked to see us. Stan Cass, Lieutenant Colonel Stan Cass. And he went over there. He, he and my, him and I had uh, done some things together, and I'd flown him a couple of times and everything else. And he says, uh, you, guys are, you guys are really lucky. Oh, Colonel, what do, what do you mean? <laughs> well, you're all dual rated, right? Uh, yes. Well, yeah. Uh, Hudson, you're going to be my logistics officer. <laughs> uh, I want to go home. You can't go home. I've got your body. You've been reassigned. As soon as you get this unit stood down over here and packed up and sent home, come on, I got a job for you. So then you sit down and write a letter to the wife, not coming home with the unit, you know. Why? <laughs> Being reassigned. When I told her, when, when we got ready to go, we were at the airport, I said, you know, at least they can only get 365 days out of me. Bad thing to say, because they got another 15 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, I... Okay, I uh, went over with the 11th Combat Aviation Group, started flying with them, got checked out in, in helicopters again, and uh, was working the, I was working for a major, and the major came in one day and said, listen, Gabe, I've got to run to the States for just a couple of days, <laughs> and I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. Well, he never came back, so Cass said, well, you, you turn in the unit, you're, you're, my, you're my four. Oh, man. I, I want to go home. Yeah, I, well, you can. Yeah, I said, you and I will go home together. So we were on the last airplane out of Da Nang. And I can truthfully say, I can truthfully say, sir, that I turned the lights off at Da Nang. <laughs> when, when we got ready to leave the compound that morning, we turned, we turned over the, the last of the equipment, everything else, turned it over to a Vietnamese unit. And I said, Colonel, you ready to go to the airport? And he said, I'm ready to go to the airport. And I flipped the switch. I said, I turned the lights off at Da Nang. Very Get good. out of here. <laughs> so we, we went to the airport, uh, 28 March, 73. All right. So you were in Vietnam at the time. There was a, the North Vietnamese launched a major offensive in the spring of 72. Oh, yes. And were you there during that? Yes. And oh, yeah. We, did, that, did that offensive affect what kind of work you were doing? Or? We, did a, we did a lot of photo work when, when they were, they had, you know, actually open tanks at that point, And uh, they had tanks up north. And uh, somebody said, hey, there's tanks up there, you know. Go up and take, go up there and take a look around see if you can find any tanks. Well, they didn't appreciate us looking around. And uh, we shot up some airplanes. Didn't, didn't hurt anybody, but they, they shot some of our airplanes up really, really bad. I went back and said, yeah, they have tanks. <laughs> they have tanks. <laughs> we got pictures. <laughs> no, you don't have tanks. <laughs> they have tanks. They've developed the pictures of tanks. Damn, tanks. They've got, North Vietnamese got tanks right there. Sir, we've told you that for a long time. So that, that was a, they, we worked pretty hard during that thing there. There was some very, very long hours and days mm -hmm. that uh, we were just trying to keep them up there, Dong Ha area, uh, Quang Tri, mm -hmm. and they leveled those areas. That, uh, see, now, over the, and that second tour, then, did you have much of a sense of sort of what was going on with the war or how well it was going or did things, was there any different atmosphere than there was the first time you were over? Uh, morale wasn't as good with the, with the soldiers. Um, aviation units, the morale is normally you know, quite a bit higher than it is with the, with the ground pounders out here. Um, yeah, well, you, you kind of knew what was going on. Um, of course, you got mail from home and you read the Stars and Stripes, and you kind of felt that you know, we're getting our, our butts kicked. We're going to get out of there because the politicians at home were just, you know, they were 
dead set against everything. And in, uh, the Washington and the White House was running a war at that point. Yeah. And now, did you have any sense of sort of how well the South Vietnamese were going to be able to do on their own? Or oh yes, we we had. That's why we're feeling so bad. Is that they they were infiltrated so heavily, as, as we found out. You know, in hindsight, it was 2020, but we were pretty sure that once we left, once we pulled our combat troops out of there, it was going to be a matter of time until until it fell. And from 73 to 75, 30 April when it. Now, did you have much contact with Vietnamese military personnel, I mean, especially as you were turning things over to them? Yes. Yes, we, we we were on a on a on a regular basis once I, once I got to the cab, we were turning airplanes over to them, and um, they would come and look at an airplane and they'd want us to to change the windshield from plexiglass to glass because that was a that was a new thing that they were adding to the UH one at that time. We couldn't get glass for our helicopters, but we were putting glass in their machines, and it really, really made a lot of people angry. Uh, because you'd, you'd fly at night, you know, and you got all this plexiglass that had been rubbed raw with uh, 30,000 rags trying to keep it clean, and all you've got is, is circles and haze and everything else, and you're trying to see at night uh, or during a rainstorm, and it was just a, ooh. But, oh, no, I said, oh, yeah, uh, these, these helicopters, uh, you put glass in windshield. And then tomorrow I come back. I'll take that then. We had a, I had a unit, uh, a cab unit that was up north, and they were standing down, and, and they owed me six airplanes, which we were going to take, and you, you'd turn them into the, the, the maintenance facility, and they'd fix them up, and then they'd turn them to, over to the Vietnamese. And uh, so you got all this thing all straightened out. They're going to bring the six airplanes down, set them on the ground, Gonna do it early in the morning. The, the major talked to me and said, "Now look, I'm gonna bring these things in. I'm gonna cruise everything else. We've got a 10 o'clock flight out of Da Nang. We're all going home. I don't want any BS. I don't want anything done. I want to come in, get the paperwork done, and leave." I said, "As long as your paperwork done, sir, we can do all of that in 15 or 20 minutes. You know, check some tail numbers, check a couple of things out. Uh, I'm counting on you to be straight. I'm I'm straight." So yeah, they got in there about 20 minutes later. All done. I said, Major, that machine you flew in over there? What machine? That machine over there. I didn't fly that in. Sure you did. You, you flew that machine in. I didn't fly that machine in. You, you, what's the matter with you, Captain? I said, Major, you flew that machine in here. Oh, no, I didn't do that. We're leaving. I don't know who's that. I don't know. It was here. It was on the pad. Sir, there was nothing on the pad <laughs> when you guys came in here. Look, I owe you six helicopters. There's six helicopters. Here are the seven helicopters. I don't know where that one is. That's your problem, Captain, not mine. Took his people and left. So my buddy and I went over to take a look at it. It was a pretty nice machine. B model. Not one serial number on it anywhere. No book. <laughs> okay. So old John McGee said, Think it'll start? I said, oh, it flew in here. Let's see if it'll start. Mm, smooth machine, man. We flew that thing for a month and a half. <laughs> we had our own airplane. We got ready. He got it. He got noticed. He was going to leave two days before I was. And he called me and he says, hey, I, I'm going home tomorrow morning, 5 o'clock. And I said, why are you calling? And he said, I'm not going to be there anymore. And I said, what are we going to do with that airplane? He said, Come on down, we drive it over, uh, park it in Ar Arvin P.O.L., in the P.O.L. point. That's a great idea. <laughs> Drove it over to the P.O.L. point, filled it up full of fuel, got out, had a driver pick us up. Oh. So you made your own donation. To the Probably the still airports. sitting there. Yeah. Probably still yeah. sitting there. Now, while you were there, how much contact did you have with, with any of the civilians in Vietnam? Did you see much of the local uh, population? Yeah, we, when I got to be with the 11th CAG, the uh, Combat Aviation Group, um, we made a regular run downtown for a couple of good restaurants. We'd have dinner maybe once or twice a week and uh, got, to, got to know several of them there. Um, I had a, a very close relationship with a, uh, with, a, with a Vietnamese orphanage and adopted a daughter from Vietnam who just gave us, 
our ninth grandchild a week ago, a week ago yesterday. So we were, I, I did quite a bit with the, uh, with the civilian population, selectively, mm -hmm. selectively. Uh, yeah. Did you have any sense of, of what their attitude toward Americans was, or did it just depend on where you were or when? They, they didn't want us to leave because they knew it was going to happen. And many of those, many of those people supported the, the effort, the, the, the Vietnamese, you know, the effort of us being there. And they knew they couldn't hang on to it. And they all wanted. They all wanted to get out. They all would. You know. Would you help me go? Help me go to the states. Help me go to the states. Sure, I'll help you. You can't. You just couldn't do it. And, um, How complicated was was it to arrange to adopt a child from there? Well, I, I went to the orphanage one morning because when I, when I was with the the one thirty first, the OV one company. I was the orphanage officer, and it was up to me at the end of the day to, to divide the spoils of the mess hall into three different piles, so that the uh, well, what was it a, the Buddhist orphanage, a Protestant orphanage, and a Catholic orphanage all got the same amount because if they didn't get the same amount, they had complained. So it, it took an officer to do that, and uh, in the in the process of doing that. I got to know that the nuns, I'm a Catholic, and I got to know the nuns fairly well in the Catholic orphanage. And uh, I went in there one day, and I said, Sister, Sister Rose was her name. She was about three feet high, I think. And I said, I'd, I'd really like, I think my wife and I want to adopt a, a little baby out of, out of Vietnam, take it to the States. Wait, I wait, 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 wait. She left. I mean, just that fast. Mm -hmm came out carrying this baby. Here, you're a baby. Wait a minute. <laughs> I can't, no, <laughs> not now. <laughs> I can't take a baby now. Oh, I know, I know, but this is your baby. I know, this is your baby. Uh, I thought maybe I get to choose. No, you don't get to choose. This is your baby. I know, this is your baby. Uh, oh, okay. I, I guess so. And uh, there was a, she had a, a contact uh, an American worker over there that helped with some of the paperwork in, in the Da Nang area. We had to hire a lawyer here in the States, and he worked pretty almost gratis. At, we, Nan, my wife found him. She was at, at Lewis at the time, Fort Lewis. And he did most of his work for nothing. Um, a lot of the paperwork, all it needed a red stamp. And a lot of the red stamp was done in Saigon. You couldn't do it locally. You had to go down to Saigon. So of course I had a had an airplane at my disposal, and Saigon was you know two and a half hours away. So I'll, I'll fly it down. But every you go to these ministers down there, you know all these different ministries, and everybody wanted a bribe. Everybody wanted ten bucks, twenty bucks. Well, when I got ready to leave country, they I. Said, oh no, okay, you, you, baby, baby goat, 200. And at that point, I ain't paying. <laughs> All right, so she didn't come home with me. And I uh, got home, and the wife said, Where's the baby? Still there. I explained the situation. You should have paid. Oh, gosh. I didn't. You had to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody had their hand up. Everybody had their hand up. You, you get to the point, I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore. So uh, that was uh, March. In about June, I think, we got a letter from this girl over there. And we had to send him $600 for plane fare. So uh, cashier's check, you know, something, don't, not a personal check. Yet. So we did it, sent $600. Never heard another word. Um, in August, about this time, it's right around this time of the month. Uh, one Sunday evening, we had already got to bed. We had two boys, and uh, the phone rang. I said, this is so-and-so. I'm in Los Angeles. I'll be in Phoenix tomorrow morning at 9. I have your baby. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, I have your baby. It'll be there in Phoenix at 9. So I was at school. Called my class leader and said, "I gotta go pick up my baby." 
Most people do that at the hospital game. <laughs> but we, we drove the Phoenix and she was one sick, she was a sick puppy taken care of. Mm -hmm. She was, she turned out to be a, a, a delight. She graduated from high school, summa cum laude, graduated from a college, summa cum laude. She's worked almost uh, since 94 for Delta Airlines. She's a special education teacher. She works two jobs. And uh, she's married to a Marine Lieutenant Colonel who's in Iraq for his sixth tour. <laughs> she's the one that just had a baby. Mm -hmm. So so she, she ended up very, it was, it was a delight. And uh, she came and, and proved to be a, a very worthwhile young lady. All right. So you've kind of, now what was it like to come home this, the second time from Vietnam? I mean, you talked a little bit about the reception the first time. Was it different? Well, it, it, it was a, a little bit different. You, you came home and, uh, you, you know, it, the, the war effort had, had died down considerably. Um, we changed clothes in Hawaii. So we were traveling in civilian clothes. We weren't, we weren't carrying, you know, anything like that. And, um, we we're just, you're just glad to get back home. Glad to get back home and uh, spend a couple of weeks before you go back to the Army. All right. And, now by this time, had you basically decided that you were going to have a, a career in the military or were you just looking to get out or? No, it was, you know, you already, with each, with each school, you know, you learn fixed wing, you learn rotary wing, each of those carry a, uh, an obligation, you know. So, okay, by the time the obligation's going to be up, it's going to be eight, nine years in the service. Uh, you know, it's, it's not too bad. I uh, could have gotten out. Could have gotten out, and a lot of my friends did. They said, hey, you know, you've got some skills. Go with the airlines. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a, had a bunch of kids at home, and military life wasn't that good, but wasn't that bad either. So, uh, okay, we, we'll hang around for a while. And we just decided that, yeah, that's going to be it. And then after uh, I came back from Vietnam and went to school, went to the advanced course, military advanced course, and then the uh, Department of Army said, you need a degree, and sent me to college for a year at St. Benedict's out in Atchison, Kansas. And that was a good year. Now, full, full pay, full benefits. Uh, they picked up the, they picked up everything. All I had to do was go to school, and that that was a fun year. That was a that was a great family year. And um, so then it was to Fort Bragg. We went to Bragg, and, and I got a uh, a company there. I commanded a company there for a while, and was at Bragg for three years. Left Bragg, and uh, we went to uh, with the reserve components up to Wisconsin. And I got a chance to, to really learn how to fly helicopters up there. I was with a, an attack uh, unit. I was an advisor. Had never, <laughs> other than flying an attack machine like 10 hours, that's all I, but I was an advisor. And I told the people in, at DA, I said, why are you sending me a fixed wing pilot? I've got, you know, 300 hours in a, in a UH-1 zero hours in the Cobra, and you're sending me there, well, you'll learn, you'll be all right. And as it was, it was a great tour. It was a great, great tour. And then from there, we went to Korea. Now, we were in Korea for about three, three and a half years, three years. All right. And when was that? Uh, we got to Korea in 80, uh, went to Korean language course in 81. So we went to Korea in 82. And we spent a year out at Monterey in the, in the language course, learned to speak to Korean. And difficult language. Now I'm 30, maybe 35 years old or something like that. And uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe even older than that. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm not too good at language anyway. I barely speak English. So they sent me to language school, complete the the whole thing, get it to get my little diploma, go to Korea, end up over there. My first night in Korea, they put us up in this hotel. Well, the flight from Seattle to Seoul was like 17 hours or something like that. And I got to Seoul and got to this hotel. So now you're running at about 21, 22 hours that you've been up. And all I really want is just a cold beer and something to eat. So I go, they put us in a hotel, Korean hotel. That's U.S., you know, it's a, 
supposedly U.S. And so I go down to the bar in my very, very best Korean. Hanjang Mekchu, which is one beer. And this cute little thing said, what? <laughs> Hanjang Mekchu? What? <laughs> Do you speak English? <laughs> yes. Do you want a beer? <laughs> That's what I would like. <laughs> but the rest, of the, the rest of the tour, I worked in a combined headquarters over there with, uh, with Koreans. And it was, a, it was a great tour. The Korean people are absolutely outstanding people. They, they like Americans. And all you need to do is just show a little bit of interest in their culture and their country, and they love you. And they'll do just about anything for you. So we had a, we had a, we had a great time. And by this time, we had some kids and had some little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girls and take them to a market. And the mama signs would just go absolutely crazy. Come over there and pull their hair. My wife, my wife was a blonde. They'd, they, you know, they'd sneak up behind and they'd pull their hair. And they'd, they'd, feel, they'd feel their hair. And then they would turn around and, and look in your eyes, you know. <laughs> and then they would yak, yak, yak. And then some other would look at their... I told my wife, I said, don't worry about it. They're not going to hurt you. You know, they just, they're interested in, in you, and they don't see very many blonde babies. Mm -hmm. We had a baby in Korea, and that was, that was very interesting because we had a maid, and the maid assumed that it was her baby. And my wife and her used to fight cat and dog about who's going to take care of that baby. <laughs> but she, she, loved, she loved the family. Um, she was, she was just like another mom. The kids would come home from school and walk it in there. Take your shoes off. You don't walk in this house with your shoes on. Take, take your shoes off. Hey. I'd come home. Hi, Mrs. Kim. Bring me a beer, you know. Hello, daddy's home. Daddy's home. Never said anything to me. She treated me like a king. <laughs> and I loved it. What impression did you have of uh, South Korean military officers that you dealt with? South Korean? Mm -hmm. Outstanding. They, they were they all wanted to speak English. They all worked very, very, very hard. And all of them very, very dedicated to their country. Now, this was a period when South Korea was kind of in transition, sort of toward a more democratic kind of state yep. or that kind of thing. I mean, to what extent were you aware of that or did that? Not, not a, we, we didn't get involved in the, in the political uh, thing at all. You know, you hear about it and, and the, the Korean counterparts would talk about it. Mm -hmm. And they'd tell you what's going on downtown and what was happening to who. And, and they'd say, hey, don't go in this section. You know, stay away from here. Um, for one year over there, I was out at a, at, a, at a Korean headquarters. I spent a year at a Korean headquarters. And uh, that was very, very interesting there because the, the guy that I worked for didn't like Koreans. And it took them about 10 minutes to figure that out. And he told me, he said, you've got... He said, Colonel, you've got all the social issues. I don't want to hang with these people. And they basically just shut him out of the net. But boy, I had some great, great times. And uh, they, were, they were very, very dedicated. You know, when a Korean officer says, this is where we die. When North Korea comes, we die here. Kill many of those, though, before we go. Very, very dedicated, all proficient. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're Korean, and their culture is different. Uh, a couple of times, the chief of staff out there, who was a graduate of uh, University of Kansas, him and his wife both, uh, Paki Do, the commanding general, three, or lieutenant general, he was a graduate of University of Kansas, a graduate of Army General Staff School, Army War College, spoke fluent English, his wife was a, uh, had a, her master's from somewhere here in the States, spoke fluent English until they got with their Korean counterparts, and then it was, it was totally Korean and everything else. But he, they, were great, they were great people, and uh, I was very, very happy to, to work with them. The night before we left, we had dinner with Paki Do and his wife, General Paki Do, and uh, just great guy. The, the chief of staff would call me and say, uh, tomorrow's holiday, American holiday. Uh, no, Colonel, we don't have a holiday tomorrow. Uh, I think 
maybe Americans have holiday tomorrow. You know, don't go to the compound. Uh, we have Korean things to do. Yes, sir, I understand. So, hang up the phone. Holiday tomorrow, nobody work. Tomorrow, Sunday, boat. You know, it was always on a Saturday. So they had normally discipline time. And they had disciplined soldiers because they'd want us around. Either they'd shoot them or, or whatever it was, but it was always public. Beat them. And you go back on Monday, somebody would say, ah, three deserters. We shoot them dead. <laughs> okay. okay. I don't, I don't want to know that. No. A little different. So All right. That was, it was a good tour. So what was your next step after that? I, I came back to Forces Command. Well, I went back to, to Atlanta. And uh, when, I, when I left Korea, they wanted to send me to the Pentagon. I was newly promoted lieutenant colonel. And they said, you need a tour at the Pentagon. And my wife said, no. And I said, no, we're not going to the Pentagon. Then you're going to retire. I come. If need be, I was at right at 20 years, and if need be, I'll, I'll retire. So we were negotiating back and forth what I was going to do, and they called me and they said, all right, we're going to send you to Fort Gillum, Georgia. You're going back to the reserve components. Okay. Don't ever expect another good assignment. Wasn't really expecting a good assignment this time, you know. All right, so I go to Fort Gillum with a readiness group down there, walk in, and the full colonel was in command, Dan Campbell, and he looked up at me and he said, you an aviator? Yes, sir. What do you fly? I said, well, both fixed and rotor. You got any OB-1 time? Yeah, I do. Ah, right. we got an OB-1 unit here in Georgia. They need an advisor. You want to be on flight status? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent five years with that unit on flight status. And uh, that was a, a very, very rewarding time. Um, year, almost two years into the, into the tour, um, the commander had a heart attack and died on a, on a track. And uh, I, was, I was the deputy. So we did all the things, got him planted and all that taken care of. It. Uh, I was working for a General Betke, and uh, he came down. We were, we were all at Second Army together at Fort Gillum, and he walked into the office unannounced. Normally, general officers would always call and say, hey, we're coming to, we'll be in your area. And he walked in unannounced. And the secretary said, General Betke, what are you, I, where's, where's Hudson? I want to see Gabe. Well, he's back in his office. Why is he in the old, he's, he's a commander. He should be in that office there, you know. And so he come, just, he was a very loud, very loud, good man, uh, major general. So he come walking down to the hall. Hudson, where the hell's Hudson? Uh, so I stuck my head out. I said, General, what, what are you doing? Why didn't you call? You know, he said, Dad, I don't need to call. I'm a general. He says, what are you doing down here? And I said, I'm doing my work. And he said, uh, well, listen. I want to talk to you. Let's go, to the, let's go up to the office. So we walked into the commander's office, and he sat down at the desk. And I pulled up a chair and got a coffee. And uh, he said, uh, did a good job putting Dan on the ground. Excellent, excellent job. You really like this, don't you? I said, like this. He says, you like being the commander? I said, absolutely, sir. Well... You know, it's an 06 position. We're going to start looking for one. In the meantime, take acting off that commander. Uh, we'll let you know. So I had it for a year. They gave me a year. And I was, I was in hog heaven. I, I was commander, still flying. Uh, called forces, command, say, hey, I need a helicopter. I'm going to go visit this year. Oh, yeah, whatever you need, sir, whatever you, whatever you need. I need a crew too. Yeah, whatever you need, whatever you need. So it was, it was, uh, it was a great tour. Okay, and you did that for a year. Then after that, were you back to second in command again, or did you? Move yeah, to I went back to second in, in, in command for a, for a year, and then uh, and I had an eye problem, and uh, I lost I lost part of this right eye, and lost my flying seat, 
So I was, I was supposed to go to Turkey and take a, a, an aviation unit over there. Well, I had a medical problem, and then I also had a bunch of kids, and they said, no, we, we can't take you, or we can't take the kids. We can't take you at all. So they gave me a battalion at Forces Command, and I became a battalion commander with the Security Battalion at Forces Command. We took care of special intelligence. And I did that until I retired. In 93, it was, we went through the, the Gulf War. Uh, it wasn't fun. And not being able to fly anymore. I said, no. So what were you doing at the time the Gulf War was going on? Uh, we were working with uh, special intelligence. Okay. It, was, it was our job. It was as a security battalion commander. Uh, I had something like 37 different detachments. And our job was to secure special intelligence. Okay, and where was that, or was that everywhere? Or? We were all over CONUS. We had one in Panama and one in Alaska. We had a detachment, and then, um, and we were headquarters out of, out of Forces Command. And where is that? At, at, at Atlanta, right at Fort okay, McPherson. Okay, so Atlanta. All right, right. We, we stayed right there. So the, the kids, the, the, the younger kids, that was home. We, we lived there in Atlanta for about eight years. And they, this is home, man. I don't remember moving. <laughs> this is home. Right. So and then in ninety in ninety three, I just said, I know I'm never going to get promoted. I've got an eye problem. I'm getting out. So we I retired, and re retired for. Uh, I I had two jobs, and then I was working for the state of Georgia, and. The, Ken Scott from here in Grand Rapids called me and said, I got a job open as an ROTC instructor. Do you want to do that? And I said, uh, what does it pay? And he said, not much. I said, how are the hours? He said, not good. I said, when are you interviewing? He said, Thursday. I said, are you paying for the ticket? No. <laughs> so I called the wife and I said, what do you think? And she said, well, if we get to go back to Michigan, she said, I had a mother here. My mom was still alive, and I had a brother who was over in, in the Detroit area, and he was sick. He had cancer. And I said, let's, let's do it. And so I flew up and uh, was there 15 minutes or so with the interview, and they offered me the job. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come to Grand Rapids. And, I'm, and I'm, we have a, a very rewarding time. Regardless of what they say on the news about Union High School right now, we had a good program over there. Mm -hmm. We did a lot for the school, a lot for, a lot for the kids that were in, were in our program. We had about 15, 1,600 of them went through my program the 13 years that I was there. What did the ROTC do for them? What, what did the kids get out of it generally? Uh, leadership, citizenship. Um, you know, kids got to do, kids who, they couldn't be a jock, they're, they're too small. Or they're, they just want, didn't want to be a jock or something, but they could learn how to with a little bit of leadership skills, and you give them a project to do. Hey, man! I, and and they do one or two of those little things, and then we we competed. We we had some drill teams and and the like, and we competed in a, in a four three or four state area here, uh, and of course they took their competition very very seriously, and then. We took all of our military duties. You know, whenever we moved the colors or anything like that, it was that was very important. And and we did a lot of volunteer work for the school. The uh, principal could call and say, "I need this done," and we always said yes. And did it sort of encourage the students to kind of stay in school and finish and, and go on from there? Uh, a couple of them it did. Sometimes it, it didn't have a, a great effect. Uh, we weren't recruiters. Mm -hmm. We couldn't teach tactics or anything right. like that. But uh, we. I've still got probably 10 students that are in the military that email me. I got two in Iraq right now. I, but just in terms of just encouraging them to just finish school and actually graduate and that kind of thing. A, a couple of them, yes. You you don't touch everybody. You you don't touch everybody. But you know if you get two or three a year that you can change around. And um, one kid came in there one time. He had a couple of piercings. Looked like a you know, one of these metal freaks that you see, and, and uh, by mid-year, he had got rid of all of his piercings and he had gotten a real good haircut. He was, I want, I want to do it. This is, this is fun, Colonel. This is fun, and I feel important. Hey, have at it. 
All right. Uh, uh, your wife followed you through this extended military career and all these moves and changes and, and, and so forth. Um, in a basic level, what, what did she think of army life or military life, or how did she respond to it? Hated it. A um, lot, of, lot of traditions. She did that. She did not like to follow the traditions. You know, I'm, I'm not putting on white gloves to go to, to go visit the battalion commander. Yes, you are, honey. Okay. Um, she was an excellent military wife, absolutely superb. And I and I, I don't know if I told you this last time or not, but uh, for for 27 years, uh, airplanes and mission, uh, and then came family. And my and my career was in there too, and that was all. And and now we're we're trying to make up on that. She understood that. The kids understood that. And uh, I'm not particularly proud of that, but that's that's the way it was. And she was 100% supportive of of anything that I ever wanted to do. Now, how much of the tradition sort of stuff did she actually have to deal with? Was that mostly early in your career? Early, earlier in the career. Uh, once I became a battalion commander and things, we. We didn't do a lot of those things, and, and it was always kind of laid back. We had a house with a nice pool, and you invite everybody over. We're going to have a pool. We're going to have some beers, and we throw some burgers and brats on the grill. There's, you know, we're going to have, we're going to relax. We're not here for white gloves and and hats. Uh, early in the career, during Vietnam, um, we got invited to a thing on the New Year's Day at Fort Lewis, and we arrived, and. Uh, the missus opened the door and said, there are some very important guests here right now, so just wait outside. And it was raining. And then we were probably there 10 minutes, and she opened the door and said, come in, see the colonel, and leave. Don't eat anything, because we have very important people coming later. Yes, ma'am. And as we were leaving, she said, I'll never do that again. <laughs> she was drenched. One, one couple went home. He said he had some very choice words. And he turned around and went home. Oh. And, uh, uh, now, I guess another thing, uh, somewhere in the course of the end of your career, you uh, knew or, or worked with Colin Powell. Oh, he was, he was, a, he was, yes. You guys were, Colin Powell was uh, Sink Forces Command, Commander in, Commander in Chief. Forces Command, and uh, and he came down to Forces Command. Just he, it's a superb man, it's a superb man, uh, regardless of his politics, you know. But uh, one one thing about Colin Powell is he had a 1967 Dart, and that's what he drove. And his first day on the job, he drove that, drove over to Forces Command, and, and he was one to get to work fairly early, and. Uh, parked his dart and went upstairs to, to go to work. And the MPs that were out in front of the building, you know, they, huh, whose car is it, whose car? And they towed it away. <laughs> and he came on and he said, where's my, where's my car? <laughs> what kind of a car was it, sir? 67 dart. Oh, God, we towed it away. <laughs> Paul was, a, he was, He'd get in the elevator. You know, the command staff, the commanders, and they all had their own elevator. You know, the important VIP elevator. But he had two or three times a week. He just got on board with us. You know, and uh, morning guys, how y'all doing today? Just very, very personal. Very, very easy to talk to. He, he was a great guy. Great guy. Great guy. All right. Uh, now we've. Covered quite a bit of material. We've been at it for the better part of two hours, so we've oh. done pretty well here. Uh, hey, tape is cheap. You know, I'm not sure what they think here at BCTV, but that, that's <laughs> the basic rule on this. Now, if you look back over the course of the uh, military career, I guess, first of all, are there particular episodes or things that kind of stand out in your mind about that that we've managed to leave out of the story to this point, whether it was Vietnam or it was in the States or other well, stuff that would be good to get on the record? You could, you could talk for three days, four days, you know, because there's, I know when I get home, I'll say, geez, I should have done this, I should have done that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, a lot of very, very personal things that I don't share. I probably should someday, but I don't. Okay. Uh, and, uh, um, 
No, it was just my, my time that I spent with the U.S. Army was all very, very rewarding. I never, I never asked for the moon. I, I always asked for a job rather than a location. And the people that I worked with, people worked for, and people that worked for me were all outstanding people. There was, only, you know, you know, one or two little along the way, but across the board, outstanding, outstanding American citizens, um, hardworking, dedicated, all of, with one thing in mind, you know, we're here to protect the country. And at any time, you know, they, we could have been called upon to, you know, call in the check, we're going to cash the check, you know, up to and including one life for the country. Because every, every vet wrote that check. And we're just, I was just very, very glad and very happy to serve. And, and I had a, a, an excellent time doing it. It was fun. It really was fun. Do you see a, a different attitude in, in this country these days toward people in, in service as opposed to back in the Vietnam era? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when, when you're, you're traveling through an airport or something like that now, and, you know, uh, five or six servicemen get off an airplane, it's not unusual to have a bunch of people stand up and applaud them, you know. Um, see one soldier get on an airplane, somebody in the captain will say, move him to first class. You know, move, move that guy to first class. A um, lot different than the Vietnam days, you know. Um, and, I, and I'm glad of that. You know, you tell, you tell people now, you know, what would you do? You know, I spent some time in the military. And thank you for your service. And you don't know how much that means. It really, it really, hurt, you know, helps you right there when somebody mm -hmm. says, thank you for your service. Were you ever in Vietnam? Yes, sir, I was. You know, oh, thank you. Where the hell were you 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you know? Oh, sometimes we learn something from history. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But there, there, there's a, you know, and it's so great for the, for the military to, to have that change of attitude. You know, people deployed overseas now, and you've got these people making pillows and bears and, and sending them treats and, and things like that. It's, uh, it's just really, really great. All right. I think that makes a pretty good note to close on. So I'd just like yeah, to thank you for coming in and talking to me today. Again, my pleasure. I, I totally, totally enjoyed it. All right.